Good afternoon, pet parents of Regina. We are coming to you live with Dr. Ryan Yamka, as promised, for this week's Furry Friday, um, doing our whole month on pet nutrition. So we thought, what better person to talk to than the guy who knows everything about pet food? Dr. Ryan Yamka, welcome. Hello, thanks for having me. Yes, well, I, I tell people oftentimes in the store that every time I think I know something about pet food or pet nutrition, then I talk to you and I realize how absolutely little I know. And there is so much more to know. But you've spent a lifetime already in the space of pet nutrition when you worked for Hills and Blue Buffalo and Hearts you worked for as well. Sure. Yeah. And, just, and <laughs> just to name a few. Yeah. And I also did my master's and PhD in canine nutrition as well. Okay. Okay. And when you were working with kind of like the blue buffaloes and the hill science, you were their head formulator, right? Like you were, that's kind yeah, of what so Out of graduate school, um, I started out as a scientist um, and I grew up, if you will, uh, th for about eight years there. Uh, doing a lot of research on uh, product development, things of that nature. Um, I had received, let's say, over 50 patents while I was there, did a lot of publications and everything. Um, then I moved to the East Coast after my dad passed, even though I don't sound like I'm from the Northeast in, in the U.S., a uh, bit diluted out a little bit. But I uh, moved back. I worked for Hearts for about a year and a half where I did uh, supplements, a lot of small animal um, foods, birds, uh, hamsters, stuff like that. A lot on cat litter and training pads. So if you want to learn about cat litter, that could be in a whole nother show. Okay, um, well, and then after that, I went and I became a senior vice president of Blue Buffalo um, when they were a smaller $400 million company to when they went public. Uh, launched well over 300 new food items, so not bag sizes or cans, as well as their clinically proven vet line. Uh, after that, I ended up leaving um, to start my own consulting company and then ultimately uh, Guardian Pet Food. But I, in that time, I, I worked with a lot of small, uh, medium startups that were doing human grade foods, raw foods, freeze dried foods, air dried foods, you, you name it, um, as well as a lot of ingredient companies as well. And now Rodney Habib refers to you as the Darth Vader of the pet food world. Yes. <laughs> At one point, yes. Yeah. I love yeah. it. And, and I tell folks that all the time because we sell Noble, which is the food under Guardian Pet Food. Um, and we're very proud to carry it. And I think we might be one of the only ones in Western Canada that you, is currently you, you carrying are. Noble. Yes. Yeah, you, I'm okay you, with that. We're okay being trendsetters. <laughs> <laughs> you, you are. Hopefully everything goes well. well. We'll actually have a distributor closer to you. So uh, yeah. it'll be a little more uh, easier access for you. But yeah, we're yeah. definitely... Uh, we're definitely pulling some strings and favors for you. And, and I love it. And I appreciate that. And I love that I have access to you and Jim, your business partner, because again, you guys teach me so much and we're extremely proud to carry Noble. We talk to folks about it all the time. And this is why we refer to Ryan as, or we, where Rodney refers to Ryan as the Darth Vader of the pet food world, because He's come to the light side. So where he was creating those prescription foods and that kind of traditional kibble, he now creates a freeze-dried raw meal bar, the first of its kind in the industry. Um, kicked the crap out of kibble. That's the slogan, right? I should grab my martini glass that says we could <laughs> kick the crap out of kibble. Um, but we're happy that we're, we, we always now, of course, our folks know that freeze dried, and we tell them all the time, maybe isn't necessarily always affordable for large breed dogs, but we always encourage topping with it at a very, very least. So we do sell a lot of freeze dried. We've got a lot of folks who are hooked on Noble and they do a combination of other foods. So, and the campers, the campers who are going out grabbing that meal bar with their pups, love it. Love yeah, that, originally that, that was our concept was really for on the go, um, even for raw feeders, right? Because um, you don't want to carry a cooler of meat on the weekends. Um, and, uh, you know, I'm not a marketing or advertising person, neither is Jim. And so 
little did we know that it would quickly catch on to an everyday feeding, which is why we went to the bulk bags and, and everything else that you see. Um, now, also, the other thing we, we didn't know um, is we're actually the only freeze-dried Canadian food. And so when Champion moved their facility to Bowling Green, Kentucky, well, you know, little did we know because we, we, you know, we live in our own little bubbles that, yeah, we're the only Canadian freeze-dried uh, food up there. So. Yeah. So, and that's interesting, too, because you guys, so... Ryan's trying to tell us which side of America he has an accent from, but when we're Canadian, you just sound American. So we don't know the difference unless you're yeah. from New York, then we can pick those ones out or maybe it's just me, but, but you got, you and Jim both live in the States, but Noble is manufactured in beautiful British Columbia. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So um, long story short, when we started guardian in um, 2017, we actually started with um, the idea um, in essence, uh, you know, for, for people that geek out in nutrition, I, I was, you know, it would be the equivalent to giving somebody the keys to the car and say, pick your car and drive away with it. Um, he said, Hey, I got an idea. How would you build it? Um, I built it, obviously wanted freeze dried. So, you know, I can make everything all natural ingredient, not add anything back when, if I didn't have to, um, and long story short, we were like, crap this actually worked. Um, <laughs> and, uh, we did digestibility testing and it, and the digestibility testing, which is on our website, um, it, it tests higher than most therapeutic kibbles, which it's always been a part of a sore spot with me is why do you have to wait till your animal's sick to get a highly digestible food? But, um, we made that the premise of everything we do. Um, and then the bar format, because I did a lot of research um, and obesity at my time at Hills was, hey, how do I put it in a feeding format that, that makes it easy to feed and not overfeed? And in our uh, search for a manufacturer, um, we couldn't find anybody that could make it. Um, and fortunately, the company that uh, we went with, I did some consulting for them um, during my time. And when I called him up, he said, nope, we can't do it, but I can certainly do it for you. Um, and so, uh, as I mentioned, you know, conceptually, we started out in 2017. Um, we rebranded uh, <laughs> right before coronavirus hit to Noble, um, because as I mentioned, we're not a marketing company, so we couldn't come up with a creative name. Um, yeah. But it definitely fits our, our mentality and mantra. Yeah. Uh, and, and so, yeah, the rest is, is kind of history. So um, everything that we source um, right now with our treats and our foods is all U.S. and Canadian sourced. We do occasionally source um, beef from New Zealand, uh, which there's only other place that's mad cow free. So that's why. Um, and yeah, so, so yeah, we've, uh, we actually keep everything sourced locally too. And so um, one of the things that you'll see uh, here in the next few months is we're actually losing the TerraCycle logo off of our packaging and we're actually switching to a Recycle2 uh, plastic logo. So you'll okay. be able to recycle it. Um, but more importantly, we actually went with the uh, packaging partner in Canada. So you'll see that flip on our website. That's within 20 minutes of the manufacturing facility. So it, it helps on the sustainability things where most people focus on just what the package is. We, we yeah. go local sourced ingredients, obviously, and as well as uh, packaging and how, how close can we get to the source with everything. And and they are tasty ingredients, too, because we've got quite a few little floofers who obsess about their noble food and, and the treats as well. So they come in and they clean us out quite a bit on, on the <laughs> treat side. So, um, okay, well, what we promised you, you guys, was that you could ask Ryan anything. I see that we do have a couple questions coming in live, but we also had questions that you guys put to us earlier this week. In an interest of time, we try to kind of combine some of them and make them a little bit more general versus being so specific to one pet. So hopefully we can um, get through these questions and uh, Ryan has no idea what they are. He wants the surprise. No, the only thing I, the only thing I preface it with is, um, you know, I, I have a firm belief and uh, I educate. I don't advocate or humiliate. So if you're asking me to talk bad about a brand or talk up a brand, I, I won't do either. Um, I, I'll teach you the right questions to ask. 
So, um, you know, people can become their own advocates, make their own decisions. I don't get into the organic debate, GMO debate, animal raised debate, because everybody has their own philosophies. Um, and, yeah. and that's a personal philosophy to them. Um, but yeah, more than happy to answer whatever questions they have. And, and I appreciate that. And, um, and that, and, and I appreciate too, that you, you're not about this brand over that brand. It's well, except when it comes to noble, right. But uh, aside from that, but it is about. Yeah, the unfortunately, I, I, I'm told that I don't even recommend our brand enough. So, you know, apparently I'm at fault for that. So, uh, okay, so I'll yeah, give I you the marketing. Noble, and now we can answer the questions. <laughs> yeah. Okay. <laughs> Okay, so one of the questions we got is, what is the benefit to feeding a breed-specific food? You know, the little eggs with the Yorkie on it or the Great Dane? Yeah, so um, one of the things I, I usually tell people is, um, and, and it is when you're looking at packaging, um, look at what you want to look for. Just ignore the noise. Um, lots of times it's noise. Um, they'll get into, and, and, and what do I mean by that? Yes, large breed dogs have certain requirements um, as puppies and they're growing. And, and typically what you're looking at is you don't want rapid growth. You don't want high energy food. So in essence, they, they grow, you know, full throttle um, because you want them to have a controlled growth so they don't have bone and joint issues as well as other things. But when you get into... Um, certain brands that have uh, literally a food for every breed, um, you got to really look past the marketing gimmickry. Um, and so lots of times they, they are gimmicks. Um, they'll focus on kibble shape because, hey, they got a shorter snout and it's easier to pick up. Outside of shape type things, um, you're not going to see a nutritional benefit or anything like that. You, you'd be hard pressed. And and, you know, when you get into foods like that, um, at least if you shop the way I do, and, and you probably don't want me in your store, but whenever I go into New Geography, I'm the guy that flips over all the bags to compare the ingredients and the GAs and stuff like that. Um, I probably should flip them back over, but usually I'm too involved in what I'm doing <laughs> that I forget to turn them back over. Um, so if you see a lot of upside down bags in a place, uh, I probably went through there. Brian has um, been there, yeah. <laughs> yeah, but most of the time, um, outside of you know the smaller kibble size or larger kibble size, you you, you really there's really no difference in it. Um, you know, if you if they truly were making a difference and getting past the marketing gimmickry, um, I would say you know show me the data, um, and you know and and you can't especially in the U.S. Um, and I know a lot of companies ship from the U.S. up, and so it, it doesn't differ. Um, if we were going to Europe, you would probably see numerical differences. But when people put guarantee analysis on there, um, it's really hard to tell if those foods are different because I could have a 25% protein food. And depending on what I'm doing that day, I can make it a 24% guarantee or 23% guarantee. You might see it numerically different. And in theory, it might be. But end of the day, from a manufacturing standpoint, they're not going to be different when you take into account variations. And some companies, what they'll do, um, which it, it's unfortunate, is they might lock a few ingredients to be the same inclusion rate. So for argument's sake, I'll pick corn, wheat, and rice. Well, if I put them all in at 10%, I can flip them around however I want, right? And it's still the same formula. I'm still making it mass production, but I made corn first this time, wheat first the other time, rice first the uh, the last time and to the consumer, it looks like it's three different fruits in reality. It's not. The same, yeah. And, you know, we say the same thing. Um, I also flip bags over in every store I go into. So it may, I may not give you heck for doing that cause I do it too. <laughs> but, um, uh, but we say the same thing, like with regards to that kind of that breed specific food marketers know that if, uh, you've got if I've got a Yorkie and I see a little Yorkie face staring at me from a bag, I think, oh my God, there's my dog. I must buy him the food. Yeah. But the analogy that we use is, would you give your six year old child or your sixteen year old child a different apple? And you wouldn't. They're going like just because one's taller than the other or one's smaller, they're still getting the same healthy, nutritious food. So, um, okay. And, and, the, and the other thing, the other thing I usually tell people, and it's the aha moment for them is. 
if that if that Yorkie truly needed a specific food, why isn't there a puppy and a senior and a life version of it? There's not, right? It's only yeah. adult. And it's like, as soon as they are now a senior, everybody goes back onto the same food. It logically doesn't make sense. Yeah, yeah, no, exactly. You're absolutely right. Um, okay. Is there a situation where you would recommend a prescription food? I, I know what my answer is. <laughs> <laughs> so as being that I'm not a veterinarian, obviously, so that I'll throw that caveat out there. I cannot diagnose or, or, or treat any diseases. Um, but if you have to go on a prescription food, um, I would question what is the prescription food and what is the value? And so, as I mentioned earlier, I am not a fan of waiting for it somebody to get a highly digestible kibble, right? So if you have a GI disorder that is, is, hey, he has the runs today, chances are you're gonna bring them in. They're gonna give you a six pack of cans or dry food, say feed them this for three days and it's simply a higher digestible product. There's no drugs, meds or anything special about that food except for digestibility. Um, and so from that standpoint, I, I would say, hey, should you be feeding you know, a, a therapeutic GI food, I question that belief, especially when there's companies out there that are making products that are more digestible in the marketplace today. It's like, why would you pay that extra money? Um, but if there's certain ailments um, that they're looking at and trying to track, so they might want you to be on a specific food if they're tracking diabetes and doing insulin just so they're maintaining your regimen, right? Or hyperthyroidism and things of that nature. In those cases, then yeah, it makes sense if there's a drug regimen, because if you think about it, what they're really trying to do is that they're trying to put you in a strict feeding practice. Um, that doesn't mean it has to be that food though, right? Um, it right. just means you have to be on the same page with the with the veterinarian to, to do that. Um, but there's lots of foods, you know, I, I would question what's the what's the value in it, because if you look at a lot of them, um, they usually have kiss and cousins, as I refer to them, as, as over-the-counter brands in a lot of stores. And so if somebody came to me and, and I was to invent or create a metabolic, right, um, I, as, as much as I love that food and that was my baby, when now when you look at Hill's Perfect Weight in the marketplace, you, you look at both of them and you go, well, crap, there's no nothing really different. Well, why would you pay that premium for a weight loss food where you can feed over the counter and yeah. still have the same type of feeding regimen program, which obviously would be um, food restriction. Yeah, exactly. We can achieve weight loss and still feed a more nutritious meal yeah. than a dried up crusty yeah. kibble in the bowl, right? And what a lots of times people don't realize, um, and, and this is part of the, I, I think a lot of people forget is, right, if I, if I went to the doctor and I have high cholesterol, uh, the doctor is going to tell me one of two things, right? Uh, he's probably not going to call me a lard ass, which he should, but he's going to say, hey, I can put you on these meds or you could change your diet, right? And there's usually a discussion. And when you get to the meds part, usually that's the discussion when he says, hey, Ryan, you're a lard ass. So if you lose 10 pounds, we could probably avoid it and check it. But for whatever reason, when it comes to pets and veterinarians, we tend to just take what they say as gospel and go. But it's actually an opportunity there for dialogue to say, hey, well, what if I do this? What are my other alternatives? So um, and they're more than happy to talk about it. Um, but people tend to not engage in that dialogue for whatever reason. Yeah. Um, OK, I thought this was an interesting question. And we have seen we have seen evidence that it exists. So I'm wondering, um, can your pet's diet affect their behavior? Yeah, so you know that's a that's a, a, a debatable question, right? Um, a lot of behaviorists will tell you yes. Trainers will tell you yes. Um, there's anecdotal information. There's also scientific information. So it's kind of like you know, it's um, goes back to the nature nurture debate, <laughs> right? With with kids, um, but. I mean, certainly there's there's certain products that you can give, obviously, if you want to go um, total anxiety animal, right? You could give them meds, so, which would be the equivalent to humans. 
Um, but there's also some supplements and things of that nature, which um, bring benefits and, and stuff. And there's also been work uh, when I was at Hills, um, let's just take the kibble part of the equation out of the equation, right? Um, Dr. Zicker did work actually with a company up in Canada where they looked at the benefits of antioxidants um, in senior animals um, on cognitive uh benefits, right? And so what they do is they do learning tasks and see how many mistakes and how, how quick you can correct it. Um, and uh, what they did see is obviously antioxidants, there's a benefit, which there's no big shocking surprise to that, right? right? We know that on the human side from cognitive and stuff like that. Um, and there's also, um, if we go back to the days where, you know, you can Uber ran Supreme, uh, which are long gone, um, but they also did stuff where they found that DHA, which comes from fish oil and algae oil, you know, helps with trainability uh, as well. So certainly there's there's lots of nutrients that can play into that that can, you know, help with it. Um, is it a do all end all? Um, usually not. Usually you have to have some kind of intervention, whether it's, you know, you know the, the owner or something or another trainer behaviorist coming in to help you. Um, yeah. But yeah, they, it can certainly influence. Yeah. Yeah. I, I believe that my observations are science, Ryan. So uh, <laughs> that, hey, that's all the that? science I need. <laughs> yeah. yeah. No, um, I mean, there is, and there's uh, obviously there's more, you know, more and more research coming, coming out, but um, unfortunately uh, you know, you don't see uh, controlled studies like you used to. And so it's um, to, to, to draw concrete, uh, uh, conclusion like they did back in the day when they did you know literally dha so we know it's dha or from fish oil that does it um it, you know it's hard to to say what it is where in this day and age if they ran a test it would be fish oil inclusion right um and so or in this day and age it might be blueberries and and pick your fruits where back mm -hmm. then they can, they literally focused on isolating the the, the compounds um, mm -hmm. But yeah, certainly um, that there's benefits. Obviously, we all know, um, you know, tryptophan is a precursor um, for serotonin, which is the good mood, right? Yeah. Um, and so there, there's research on that as well. So, so yeah, for sure. Um, it, it's kind of, I, I you know, I, it reminds me of so many people are like, oh, you can't feed a raw diet because then they get really aggressive because they start eating raw meat, right? And I, like, in, in that instance, I'm like, mm, no, you shouldn't see that behavior change. But yeah, if, yeah, that's goofy. <laughs> <laughs> if yeah, you're, I that. <laughs> if, I, where I think that the behavioral change in, in my own non, non-scientific view, I think where the behavior change could come from is if you're eating a food that allows you to literally survive, you, you're just not dying because you're actually eating yeah. something um, and you don't feel your best and you're not energetic and you, you know, all the things it's just like with us, right? If I live on McDonald's, then it starts to like mess with my head and mess with my body and all the things. And when we change the diet, we absolutely can change how we feel on the inside with energy and focus and all the things, right? So that's where I think it, as different as we are from our pets, I think there are a lot of similarities when it comes to eating the right foods. That's kind of the way that I look at it. And, and the reality of it is, is they've done uh, enough studies and it, it, this isn't a surprise, even though it came out a few years ago where they, they did um, in essence, different macronutrient contents of foods for dogs and cats. And so macronutrients, I'm talking protein, fat, and carbohydrates, right? Yeah. Um, the three classes of energy. Um, and so with self-selection, the dogs would pick and the cats would pick, uh, right? And uh, whether you believe in carbs or not, the, the, it's not part of the, this discussion, but they tended to focus on uh, obviously a lot of fats where your energy is coming from protein secondary because based off of efficiencies and carbohydrates last and a lot of people are surprised well that's what happens well it's not a surprise because when you actually look at livestock what they're usually doing is they're usually to consuming to whatever is the deficit in their diet right and so yeah. let me pick a nutrient uh, i'll say lysine so 
those livestock will consume enough food to hit that lysine requirement versus if you gave them lysine in the diet, they would probably stop eating sooner. Right. And, and so, um, and some of those where you think it's food seeking behavior, it, lots of times it's nutrient seeking behavior is what right. it amounts to. Um, and, and it's easier to, it's easy to dismiss, you know, certain breeds as, Hey, they're food driven and stuff like that. But the reality of it is, is, if they're getting what they're needed, what they need, and you're obviously, and you don't have a crazy breed like some of mine are, and you're keeping them busy just activity-wise because they're highly active dogs, and usually those those food-seeking behaviors will go away. I, I and I have read and um, heard that from many different because I've become a pet nutrition junkie as much as I can be, without without you know a degree in it or anything but <laughs> i've a, heard it's a way to go the way i, I know like, right you know, I'll, just, I'll just keep learning from facebook <laughs> <laughs> um but i've heard that a lot that our dogs and cats instinctively they know what they need right and that's kind of what you're talking about where they're nutrient seeking it's instinctively they kind of, i've i've seen and read a lot of that with essential oils too that they kind of gravitate to the oils for what will ail them you know yeah. um so anyways, it's interesting that you talk about that. We are going to be here for days. So it's my <laughs> fault. I will speed this along. Um, okay. Could glucosamine chondroitin cause severe skin issues? Yeah, so that's, um, you know, we talked about that a little bit earlier. Um, uh, you know, it, part of the issue with glucosamine and chondroitin is there's, um, at least in the States, uh, you're, you're only allowed to put it in um, adult foods. And, and it's an ingredient that actually isn't approved either um, for in foods. Um, but when you get into supplements that have it, um, the, the question is, is, you know, what is the source of it? Um, and so lots of times people don't have to say what the source of glucosamine is or, or chondroitin. Um, and many a times it's coming from um, pork or beef. Um, and so, you know, you might be seeing skin issues and it might be that, but chances are you might have a skin sensitivity or an allergy to food intolerance, whatever, to, to the source of that ingredient versus that ingredient per se. Um, and, and unfortunately, um, with the, the industry, the way it is, they, they don't always have to tell you, so if you think you have an issue and you know your dog is allergic to beef, for example, or pork, um, you know, you, you, you might want to call and ask them what the source of it is, um, especially if you're giving it to them over a long period of time. And then all of a sudden they have a skin issue. You, you might have developed an allergy just like you do in, with humans, right? Mm -hmm. um, especially if you have uh, early exposure to um, that allergen. Um, and, and the problem is, is, is people don't realize it's an allergen if it's simply listed as glucosamine chondroitin. Um, right. Lots of times it's isolated uh, from cartilage and things of that nature of, you know, bovine or beef trachea or, or pork. Um, and if you don't have that knowledge, you, you might think it's, hey, it's the ingredient or the chemicals going in there. And in reality, it's a beef allergy. Um, so it's a, you know, it's a question that certainly can ask. Um, obviously if you believe there's an issue, talk to a veterinarian, but a quick way to find out you know, is, is remove it from the diet and see if the skin clears up. Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> okay. Um, what supplements would you recommend be included in an older pet's diet? Hmm. Um, just so happens we're launching dog almighty mobility. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> um, but uh, so, yeah, there's there's a few. So um, what a lot of people don't realize, and this is part of research I also did at, at Hills and um, what we, you know, it's hard to measure success of certain things in, in animals because they can't tell you. Right. Um, and so what we did is we, we used swine as a model. Um, for arthritis in particular, because um, sows, they stand on concrete, they go into our food system. So you can look at severity of arthritis and, and benefits of certain nutrients, right? And the reality of it is, is when we get old, um, degradation of cartilage goes up, right? And 
synthesis tends to go down and consequently you have arthritis along with inflammation, stuff like that. So what do you want to do? Well, you want to, you know, if you can't slow down degradation, well, can I ramp synthesis back up? Right. So you start looking at certain compounds that are beneficial for um, arthritis, for brain health, stuff like that. Just like I talked about um, DHA being good for puppies. Uh, there's also studies to show the benefits of that for dogs, which you're going to get from fish oil, right? Um, also, fish oil brings your, your high levels of um, EPA uh, besides the DHA, which has benefits for, for joint health. Um, then other things you can look at, um, you know, it doesn't have to be gl glucosamine or chondroitin. Um, bone broths will be high in collagen peptides, which help provide similar building blocks. Um, antioxidants, obviously, just like with us. Um, so a lot of those things are, are the things you're going to look for. Um, ideally, um, the easiest way to get it is via food, um, you know, because you, you don't have to sit there and pill powder and do all that stuff. Um, so lots of times what I would do with back in the day when I was a kibble feeder is, um, you know, I would, at, when I became senior animals, I'd switch them to a salmon diet because I knew that was the biggest bang for the buck or some kind of fish diet uh, versus having to, you know, put a bunch of squirts of fish oil on there. Um, instead of doing five squirts, I'd only have to do one where I knew the dog would eat it and it wouldn't stink up my house, right? right. Um, and so um, certainly um, omega-3s, obviously, um, and antioxidants, and then, you know, depending size of your dog and stuff, you can look at, you know, bone broths and things of that nature, which bring the beneficial nutrients in there. But more importantly, you can top dress your food. Uh, you don't have to worry about, you know, putting a pill in a piece of cheese. And then if you have a lab, uh, they always manage to eat the cheese and spit out the pill. Right. And yeah, so, so you, <laughs> you, so you don't want to be in that situation. But, um, but yeah, yeah there's, there, there's lots of um, things that you can do just by switching a diet a little bit, not by a whole lot. Um, and it doesn't become a pain point. Um, there's lots of, lots of stuff that you can, um, whether it's salmon oil and things like that, you know, if you can't afford, you know, raw or, or freeze dried or whatever, there's enough individual supplements that you could top dress what you're doing today to even approve what you're, what you're feeding in the bowl and, yeah. and deliver it. You might not like the smell of it, but it works. Uh, it's healthy. Yes. That's, you know, we, I, I always say that we're bone broth pushers and I'm kind of like the red hot commercial. Cause I tell people to put that beep on everything. So, <laughs> um, and yeah. regardless of size or age, we want people putting bone broth in the bowl just for the health benefits that it sure. offers all life long. Right. So. Yeah. It's, um, um, it's actually, and a lot of people don't realize uh, how high it is in collagen peptides. Now it's, now you hear college of peptides more on TV and you'll see Jennifer Aniston talking skin health and stuff like that, but obviously it has lots of other benefits uh, besides, yeah. you know, making you look younger. I don't think a, a black lab that's gray in a face cares that he has black face again, you know, or yellow lab has a yellow face again. Um, but if, if he could jump on a bed and run and chase a ball, he'll be pretty happy. Uh, but yeah. 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 And that's, I know like for, uh, with my own little guy, Zane or the Yorkie, um, he, about four ish years ago, the vet told me that he had the onset of a luxating patella. And I was like, what, what is that? What do I do? Oh my God. And she said, nothing. He's at a stage one. You wait till he's a stage four and you operate. I'm like, what? Like, and she says, yeah. don't let him jump. I'm like, he's a six inch tall Yorkie. He jumps up the stairs. So and I don't know anything about bone broth then, but when I opened the store and I learned about bone broth, I started including bone broth in his diet every day. We have since switched to a different vet. We were there, unrelated issue, but I asked, what about his luxating patella? And she said, I saw that in the file. I, there's no movement in his knee. I, I don't even know why that's there. And I'm like, oh, bone broth? She says, <laughs> possibly. <laughs> so I believe. Like, it's like Windex from uh, what's that movie? My Big Fat Greek Wedding. You just spray yeah. it all over. Oh, your elbow's hurting. Here you go. Uh, but but yeah, I mean, there's uh, a, a lot of a lot of people don't realize that you know you can avoid a lot of those arthritic issues too by keeping your animal leaner, right? It's yeah. when they're obese, uh, obesity, and you're putting more weight on the frame. I mean, yeah. simple simple stuff like that of you know moderating you know, how an animal looks. If you have a 50 pound lab, weigh him and make sure he's a 50 pound lab. There's lots of people yes. that tell me that, yeah, my lab's 50 pounds and I look at them and they're a propane tank with legs. And you're like, no, man, ain't no 50 pound lab. 
Yeah. Um, and, and that's part that's part of the issue too, right? Is is um, not only self awareness of what, how you impact your environment, but also self awareness that you might have a fat dog, <laughs> right? Yeah. Um, and, and unfortunately, uh, you, you know, obesity uh, reality leads to tons of secondary diseases, and, and usually that's the time where you have the engagement of hip dysplasia and all the other issues when, you know, what if I would have pulled back and trimmed him down when he was two, three, four, five years old, you probably would have never seen any of those types of, of issues because you would have never exerted that amount on, on their frame. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. We, <clears throat> we tell folks that all the time too. Leaner is better. So for us to, I just need to stop living on chocolate almonds and Doritos and then I can maybe, there. I'll get there. But okay. What would be the ideal diet for dogs or cats who are prone to pan pancreatitis? <laughs> um, so typically, right, they're going to tell you low fat diets. Um, and so this is this is where um, you talk with your vet um, and they're going to tell you, um, hey, I want to feed diet X because of Y reason, right? And, and usually it's it's a low fat food. Uh, what they'll run after, um, depending on who you work with, you know, but what they're going to look for, um, and, and again, I'll, I'll, I'll use my website as an example, just so people can understand it. Uh, again, if they, you know, choose to come to your store and buy our food, great, but if not, at least they know what they're looking for. Um, yeah. but if you go to our homepage, there's a box underneath our food that says, um, uh, facts box. And if you click on that, there will open up and we tell you all of our nutrients in our food. What the veterinarian is going to look at is not that first column that has the percentages, but the next column that's over. Um, and that's grams of whatever per thousand kcals. Well, in most situations, when they're talking to you about a prescription diet food, whether it's low fat or whatever they're trying to do, they're looking for that column that's there. Um, so if you can provide that information to your veterinarian, or at least be able to, you, you might not need it today, you can call the pet food company, whatever you're feeding and ask for that information. If you have that information, and you can bring it with you, um, it makes it real easy for him to say, hey, you know what, you can't feed this food because of this. And what you really need to do is dial back on this. And then it gives you the opportunity to have the discussion to say, okay, well, should I make my own? Should I go find somebody else that's in your store that meets the nutritional profile, right, of what he's wanting you to switch to and, and things of that nature? Um, but typically that's what they're going to be looking for because um, as, as, we sh as they should, unfortunately with dog and cat nutrition, we tend to focus on decimal point nutrition where in reality it's no different than human nutrition. It comes down to grams of intake of each nutrient, right? Or milligrams in some case. Yeah. Um, and so they're going to be looking at that. And so um, typically if they're going to be looking for things like that, they're going to be looking for other attributes of the food. Um, and so that's, I think that's a discussion again that you have. So if you're a, if you're a believer or feeder in, I don't want to feed corn, he's only offering corn foods. Well, that's when you ask the question, what are you looking for? What information can I get? Let's make the decision to mm -hmm. together. Um, but typically it, it'll be a low fat food, but there might be other criteria he's looking for. But again, that that's something to have conversation with because he, it might not, it, the pancreatitis this might be the issue, but he might be focusing on two other things as well. Right. Or yeah. she. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> they, at least, at least all the ones I know, they're, they're typically she's. That's why I went yeah. into animal science back in the day. <laughs> good plan. Good plan. Always good to have a plan. Um, okay. If we have a picky pup who decides to fast on their own, how many days do we need to worry that they haven't eaten for, basically, was the question. Yeah, I... That, that's something I would, you know, if it's a day, I'd, I'd be worried. Um, and, and it's odd, right? Um, because the reason you should be worried is you don't know if he has a blockage or something going on. Um, and that could usually get resolved with, you know, ultrasound or whatever by your vet. Um, usually if animals aren't eating, there it's for a reason. Um, even if your old tricks aren't working, um, you know, they tend to, you know, all animals, if they go off feed, there's something wrong. 
Um, okay. and, so, and so if they go off feed, I'd, you know, if, even if it's giving you peace of mind and they tell you, Hey, you got a picky animal, so be it. Um, but you should immediately have them checked out because, you know, God forbid they ate something and, you know, you got a tube sock sitting in their stomach, um, right. or, or in their intestines. So you, you generally or half a Kong. Or a Kong. Half a yeah. Kong. Oh boy. Yeah, and, I've, seen, yeah. I've seen, I've seen corn cobs is another one, uh, that, you yeah. know, they then you know, there's, when I've worked at, uh, I worked at a few animal hospitals as well as uh, Virginia Tech's um, veterinary school. Uh, some of the x-rays you see, it's, it's pretty, pretty interesting. Mickey Mouse ears was another one that showed up. Um, steak knife, uh, razors, um, you know, disposable ones, which yeah. at some point you, you got to question the owner. Why do you keep, keep throwing it in that trash can? It's like you're yes. mad at the dog and the dog's had three surgeries. Why haven't you changed your behavior? Um, right. But, <laughs> but, you know, it's the dog's fault, whatever. Um, but, but yeah, it's, uh, you know, when, especially if you have the dog that eats, um, all the time, um, and they, they or cat, and all of a sudden you notice they're not eating, uh, there's something going on. If you truly yeah. have a picky eater, um, then you know what, play around with the different foods until you try to try to find the right, uh, thing. Um, obviously you'll know a picky eater from somebody who, um, decided to fast on their own, um, fasting on their own is problematic. And especially yeah. with cats, because the longer they fast and they don't eat, they set themselves up for, you know, all kinds of ailments with, with right. that. Um, so right. you, you definitely don't want to mess around with that. And I think too, like when you're saying worry, if it's a day, um, it's worry if it's a day that the animal just won't eat. It's not worry if it's a day that he won't eat supper, but the kids have been feeding him treats all day or grandma came over and shared half a hamburger or whatever, right? Like if your animal is eating other things, but just won't eat their meals, then we have to look at, okay, we got to cut out all this food and we got to make the animal know that dinner time is dinner time. You're going to eat the dinner or you're not getting it till tomorrow. So when you say that they haven't eaten for a day, we have to make sure that the kids aren't feeding them snacks all day long because we wouldn't want to eat either if we grazed all day. So C correct. It's 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 all situation dependent, right? You'll see activity level and stuff like that all play in there. But if you're if you're concerned, then you know take them in. Um, like, like I said, just uh, you know, it's peace of mind. Um, especially you know, if you have somebody that's an aggressive chewer and likes to get in the stuff, you, you you don't know what he could have necessarily you know hammered down in that twenty minutes you were gone. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Um, okay. Next one. What are the benefits of serving a variety of proteins? So there's a few uh, debates out on that, right? Um, some will tell you, well, it prevents them from getting allergies later on in life and things of that nature. Uh, you can make the argument for that. Um, but the, the sooner you introduce variety of proteins, so back to your picky eater question, you tend to not have picky eaters. Um, exactly. and, and so... Um, great example is a lot of uh, third-party feeding facilities. Um, they'll start their kittens uh, and, and immediately on rotation of wet food, dry food, switching them up in different deals so they don't get into one and done. And in the case of cats, we all know cats will starve themselves to death if you bring them home the wrong food. Um, and so <laughs> the sooner you can get uh, like cats in particular eat in varieties at a younger age, it'll actually make your life a lot easier when, when they get older. Yeah. Um, but most of the time, um, you know, people think it's a protein thing. Um, I would argue you, if you're truly wanting to see the benefits of uh, uh, an iron gut, if you will, um, you probably want to be switching out more to proteins, probably to carbohydrate sources as well when they're puppies. Um, this way, you know, you're, you're seeing the benefits of it, but, um, the one thing you got to keep in mind is, uh, you know, when you're doing it, you, you might have a food intolerance and you miss it because you switched it up to the next protein. Um, and so what you might've thought was a, a bad GI day and he got, or she got into something uh, that might've been a, a warning sign for you as well. Um, so you can't necessarily willy nilly do it. Um, but if that's something that you're doing, yeah, the, there's benefits to it. Um, obviously, uh, you know, God forbid uh, you're feeding a food one day that, that happens to be in a nutrient deficit. Um, you switching varieties and, and protein source can keep you from getting into that detriment. Unbalanced diet, yeah. 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 
So it really comes down to, to, you know, your feeding style habit, things of that nature. Um, you know, there, there's certainly no harm, no foul in that. Um, and, and the, and the ones that do it, uh, they're firm believers in doing it. Um, and even if there was science to support it or not, um, again, that's, you know, that's a, that's one of those emotional discussions. Um, so, you know, if you're a believer, uh, I'm not going to change your mind, even if I told you there was no data. Um, but you know, at least the anecdotal data that's out there that, you know, shows you that typically you don't have, um, issues. It's kind of like kids, right. You get exposure to that stuff early and find out if there's a problem or not. And usually they're not right. Yeah. So. We're, we're big believers of it. We definitely encourage it just even for the, ver the variety of amino acids. And, yeah. and of course we talk about the, you know, not wanting to try to not running the risk of creating those intolerances or sensitivities by feeding chicken, 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 because most common allergy we see is chicken and most puppy foods are chicken. So, yeah. um, and a lot of people don't realize is, you know, at some point, um, you, just like with people they were, you know, they'll say it never happens. And I say bull, cause I've worked with enough animals that you, you get food fatigue. Yeah. Um, right. And it's, and it's not because they're eating chicken all the time. It might be something else, but now all of a sudden, if they have to go to a food that is required for them, they, they might not eat it and thrive so well on it because you're changing whatever makeup that they're normally eating. Um, so it, it doesn't, it doesn't hurt. And even if you're not, it doesn't, uh, doing variety foods, you know, it doesn't hurt to, you know, if you're feeding, you know, freeze dried or, or raw meat to, to switch that up just to give them other flavors, if you will, because at some point um, you may have to switch a food from a chicken to a fish because of what stage of life in or their needs are. Um, and yet you don't want to necessarily uh, watch them, you know, fall apart or not eat it. And, and like I yeah. said, in cats in particular, early exposure to them, on different food formats and, and proteins and tastes, uh, the better off you, you will be later on in life. Um, especially since, uh, you know, cats need typically the, the liquid, uh, the water moisture from the foods. And, and you'll find out really quickly if you don't give them canned foods as kittens, they'll, they generally aren't going to mess around with them as adults. Um, yeah. and part of the mindset is, you know, they don't necessarily see it as a food. Uh, they'll see it as a treat and they won't eat as much as you really want them to do. Right. I know I am, um, I'm reading uh, an, a pet nutrition book right now. That's about this thick. Uh, I don't, I can see it from here, but I can't remember what it's called, but that's, he's talking about the imprinting period, like that kind of yeah. first five months of life, the imprinting period. So that was uh, interesting, but that's what he talks about is the more variety in that imprinting period, the more likely or the less likely it is that we will have that picky guy as they get older and set in their ways. Right. Yeah. yeah and, it, <laughs> you know, and there's um, a great example I always give and, and, and people don't realize it is um, ferrets. Right. Um, you know, where do they hunt? They hunt underground. Um, well, most the, the largest breeder is Marshall. Um, they breed them and sell them right in pet trade. And they what they start out on is foods that are based and coated in chicken fat. So figure it's cat kibble, but it's coated in chicken fat. Well, if you gave them a food at one year of age that was coated in pork fat, beef fat, whatever, because they're not used to eating that they'll literally die because when they smell that, they don't smell that and think food because uh, they're imprinted on that chicken yeah. fat aroma. And so right. they're actually seeking that based off of their predatory instincts. And so th there's a lot of truth to that. You usually see in a lot of other animals, but in cats in particular, um, they're as, even if people want to say they're pain in the ass animals, they're really foodies um, yeah. because the mouthfeel and texture plays a huge role with yeah. cat consumption and a lot of people yeah. don't don't realize that it's not necessarily a palatin or the flavor it, it really comes down to mouthfeel yeah uh, yeah they're little food snoops that's they what are. we call them they yeah sure. <laughs> um okay speaking of when they're younger how long do you recommend feeding a puppy food uh it depends on the critter um, so right, typically large breed, they'll tell you about 18 months, um, younger, about a year. Um, and I would argue even some of the smaller breeds, you could probably go shorter. Um, it really comes down to what, what the breed is, um, and what their you know, growth phase is. Yeah. Um, and keep in mind, right, is 
um, the larger breed dogs, it's not necessarily a mind, mindset that they're, that they take longer to grow. It's growing properly. Right. Um, so you don't want them to, in essence, just grow like gangbusters because, um, you could have a lot of problems, problems with that. And that's why, um, you'll see, you know, they typically top out calcium and energy and stuff like that. Cause you don't want a big fat, super growing great dane um because you'll have problems with that critter later on clifford. Yeah. you end up with clifford right yeah yeah, yeah. i don't think you want it you don't want that big red dog but yeah <laughs> uh, but but yeah you want to right it really comes down to setting them up properly for life um and so uh and a lot of times you'll the um the breeder will tell you or you can read up on you know what the puppy phase is um but you know if for argument's sake, if, you know, they consider a puppy to be up to 12 months, you know, you can change them at a year. Um, you not changing them over at that year and wait until the bag's empty or whatever for another couple months ain't going to harm them. Um, but, you know, they they don't have that high of demand for and, and that, that crazy nutrient-dense food. So Right. So a, around 12 months if they're smaller guys, but the bigger guys around 18 months is. Yeah, usually the products are pretty good about that. And like I said, breeder, breeders will give you, uh, you know, usually what their regimen is right or wrong. Um, but you, you'll get a flavor for, you know, where you're supposed to be. Um, yeah. You know, if you have a chihuahua, you know, they fall out of the womb and they're adult size. So, you know, right. it's all, all breed dependent. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. Um what do you suggest looking for in a raw food diet? This actually, um, we've often said to folks, like, if you you can feed a formulated puppy food mm -hmm. for the puppies, or you can do raw, because the important piece is that calcium and phosphorus for those growing and developing bones. True. So, um, but this is, um, same, same question to you with raw, though. What do you suggest looking for in raw? Yeah. So, so to me, I, I don't, I don't see foods different, right? So I, I don't discriminate or, or judge. Um, so, what, what, and, and, and again, it goes back to my um, original, I educate, I don't advocate or humiliate. Right. And so the, the comes down to, okay, what has that company done to make sure that food is what the food is? Right. And so do they have nutrient analysis? Do they have proper quality control? things of that nature. Um, more important, obviously, what are the feeding guides? You want to make sure it supports growth. Um, but end of the day is um, whether you're feeding um, a puppy kibble food or raw food or whatever, um, if it's doing everything, uh, let's say everything is created equal <laughs> in, in my hypothesis here or theory, yep. um, you, that dog's body's not going to care if the calcium comes from raw food or the kibble or the amino acids from pure meat or the kibble, right? The end, end of the day is if it's bioavailable, enters the bloodstream, it's going to do what it's supposed to do, right? And so um, it, it comes down to the same, the same things you would ask a, a kibble company to do. You would ask a raw food to company and vice versa. Um, there's not a, a different rules in the game, so to speak. Um, so you would look at the, the same attributes. I, I think what um, a lot of misinformation that goes on, at least in the States, is the belief that, hey, with raw food, there's all these pathogens and everything else. And, and the problem is, is, yes, there is. But usually those are the bad companies getting in trouble and then it halos <laughs> the rest of the industry. Right. right. Uh, and everybody gets thrown into that category. But the reality of it is, is if they're following proper food safety protocols, um, it doesn't matter if they're making kibble or raw food, right? End of the day is there should be zero path pathogens getting there and everybody's hunky dory. Unfortunately, um, raw food typically gets the stigma and freeze dried for that matter um, because of the one or two bad apples um, that, that play there, because that's typically what the newspapers run with. Um, exactly. But, but aside from that and let's say you're a raw foodie or a kibble or you're wanting to switch or whatever um you, you, right you want to make sure it's appropriate for that 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 life stage and it's delivering on what they say they're delivering on um mm -hmm. and if that company can't provide you with that information regardless if it's raw or kibble or pre-stride well then you, you should ask why why are you giving them your money right um, yeah. so 
So it's, uh, it, you know, it's, it's going to be the same questions um, from, from that standpoint. Yeah. And obviously, again, you know, the, the, the raw foodies out there um, are very passionate about it. And then the people that are believers that, hey, it's contaminated product, which, again, goes to like a, a couple of companies that routinely get yeah. in trouble. <laughs> it's like you, you can't shake that mindset either. Um, and so, you know, the, it, it comes down to literally a, a intellectual conversation and, and you know, hey. If I'm going to ask this for one company, I should ask this for all the companies. Um, and, and you'd be surprised at how many kibble companies can't answer those questions that you think they can answer. Um, it's yeah. a lot more. It's a lot more than what people think. Yeah, yeah. I, I think too um, when it comes to raw, and we chat with quite a few folks that are like, "Well, my dog eats what we eat," you know. So if we're having pork chops tonight, he eats pork chops. If we're having chicken, he has chicken, and I, and I know that folks who are doing that home cooking or, or they're trying to do that raw feeding at home, I know that they're doing it with the best intentions. The unfortunate thing is you can't just take a chunk of ground beef and throw it, you know, raw ground beef and throw it in your dog's dish and say, the dog's fed. Because no. it doesn't have all the things, right? And, and so in raw foods, we see that too, where there's kind of different levels, goes from grinds all the way up to balanced. And, yeah. um, and, that would be my suggestion to folks when you're looking for a raw food diet is ensure that you are buying that balanced raw food diet, not, not just grinds or raw meat. Yeah. What, one of the common things, and, and I see it and I, and I don't see it just in raw. I've seen it in, in, in industry and startups as well. Right. So it's, um, I'm not going to say it's a raw problem. It's a general thinking and problem is chickens, not chicken. <laughs> right. And, and a lot of times where um, I make a food, and I can tell you with, with Noble, the chicken we use contains the fat, contains the bone, right? And, and 80, 85% of our beef and chicken recipe is literally meat and liver between beef and chicken. Now, if I tell you, hey, for argument's sake, my recipe is 50% chicken, well, I'm talking bone fat, skin, all that stuff, because that's what dogs need. Now, if you were trying to mimic that at home, you're probably going to go grab a, a chicken breast to start out with. Well, that chicken breast has like next to no fat. And what happens now is if you use that as your anchor point, you're going to have skin and coat issues and things of that nature, because dogs actually need quite a bit of fat for skin, skin uh, and coat health and things of that nature. And so just by you thinking that all chicken is created equal and you pick the prettiest looking chicken breast in the marketplace right now, you're auto automatically starting them at a deficit. Um, yeah. And a lot of people don't get that and it doesn't connect because you're thinking, Hey, this is USDA grade, whatever, blah, 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 or whatever the Canadian version is. for your yeah. <laughs> but, but, but you think you're buying the best chicken possible because your price point, but in reality it, it, it isn't from a nutritional standpoint, right? And, for the dog. You know, yeah. Um, and so you can you can go sideways pretty pretty quickly. Um, doesn't mean you, you shouldn't consider it, but you know usually if you want to start out raw or in that category, I suggest you buy something that um, is specific for life stage. Um, and you know you can always go uh, obviously depending on what category you're in, whether it's raw, freeze dry, partially raw, whatever. But make sure you have a solid program because. You know, you, you, you might find out I would rather have a loaf or a chub of raw meat that is, uh, you know, formulated to be complete balance versus now I need another fridge to, you know, keep, you know, beef and broccoli and everything else that you're going to have to make up that diet. And me personally with um, I don't have anything against raw, um, but I do have four dogs and three kids and I want a place for my beer. Um, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so. So I, I do have a problem with it when it comes to competition with my beer, but you know, outside of that, cause you know, I got three gallons of milk that's sitting there, which, you know, when you have three kids, you, 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 that's not a battle I'm going to win. So, uh, but yeah. It's easier for Canadians, Ryan, because we have winter 10 months of the year. So our beer can sit outside. <laughs> <laughs> that's true. That's true. Yeah. Or, you know, I, probably the, the easier problems I need to switch to hard liquor and it doesn't need to be. Yeah. That's, that's, that's the other story. side of it. Yeah. 
Yeah. Nothing wrong with vodka. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, okay. Another pancreatitis. So how, because we need to go with a low fat food or yeah. lower fat food, how do we increase the energy of the animal without incorporating carbs or higher fat foods? Yeah. So you would, you would go, um, uh, you would look at um, if you were doing a raw type food, um, obviously leaner meats, things of that nature. Uh, the, the thing that a, a lot of people, and this is no different than weight loss foods, by the way, right? Similar concept, weight management foods. Um, when they go low fat, um, the major problem is, is like a lot of companies just simply mean, hey, I go low fat and off I go. Well, th that's really the wrong answer. It's what fat's left over. You have to make sure it's the right kind of fat. Otherwise, you get, you know, dandruffy dogs. Uh, if you have a black lab or black mixes like I do, their, their coat gets really dull. Um, so even when it's a low fat food or pancreatitis type food, you got to make sure that um, it's the right fats. Um, and so, you know, from that standpoint, uh, again, you know, talking to your vet through that will, will help you get there. Um, and again, they'll probably give you a list of stuff to avoid, but th there's lots of things that you can give. Um, for example, and it's one of the reasons why we launched our vegan treats, right? It's, it's low fat, low calorie, um, Dalmatians that get purine issues, um, right? It avoids all that. Uh, I'd, I'd love to say, Hey, I did it for sustainability reasons and all that. The reality was, Hey, it's hypoallergenic and it hits all these categories instead right. of me going, Hey, can you carry, you know, 10 of my treats, I said, here's four. Um, <laughs> right. And so there's, there's ways to work around it. So, you know, if you get in a situation where you're like, Oh my God, this is gloom and doom. Um, it's not gloom and doom. You just need to think about it differently. And, and again, I would challenge you to have the conversation with the veterinarian to think about it differently because end of the day is it doesn't come down to percent of fat in the food. It comes down to grams of fat consumed in a day. Um, and right. so the, and the you, type you of fat. Your, yep. And you pick your fats differently. Um, and so if that means, Hey, you know what, instead of me using, uh, let's say I'm a raw feeder, instead of me using, um, ground chicken, I got to go to chicken breasts. Now that might be an option because you're getting rid of all the fat that comes with the chicken. Right. Um, and now you put in you know, fish oil. So you're making sure you're getting, you know, the high polyunsaturated fatty acids for skin and coat. And so there's ways to, to work around it um, and, and get there. Um, unfortunately, everybody's in therapeutic, whatever category. It's like, okay, hit, let's hit pause. What's the nutritional goal? Um, and then have that conversation. Because end of the day is, and, and just like with renal disease or any of those other things, it's not decimal point nutrition, right? It oversimplifies it. You, what you're doing is what's a grams of that nutrient consumed? Where do I need to be at and, and why? Um, and there's lots of ways to get there. Obviously, the easiest is through, you know, a low fat kibble, um, because for them, um, when you make kibble, um, they coat all the fat on the outside. Right. And so if everything's made up and I can tune in and out the fat based off of what I'm applying. Yeah, that's easy to do. Um, can you get to a, a pancreatic food that is low fat, that is home cooked or another version of it? Absolutely. Um, is it going to take some work and some thinking? Absolutely. Yeah. But it doesn't mean you, you have to go to a, a kibble product. That's something that you could work through with your vet. And, and if they don't know how to do it, there's enough of them online that will help you and, and teach you how to do it. Um, yeah. In fact, they probably even have tried and true uh, formulations that are cookie cutters at this point because they've been doing it for so long that they can say, hey, do this. Right. Um, I, I wouldn't be surprised if, if it's more um, vegetable and stuff focused, which isn't a bad thing, but, um, you know, the, they'll, they'll definitely tailor that where it's probably not so meat rich um, in the sense of ground meats, but they might focus on, you know, leaner cut meats and things of that nature. Would eggs fall into that category then? Like <clears throat> for, for an animal with pancreatitis, I know that eggs are kind of like nature's food. It, it depends, it right? It all, it, it all comes down to how they're going to balance it. So if you look at certain protein sources, they're considered, quote unquote, the ideal proteins. And, and usually they are because they give you bang, bigger bang for your buck. 
Um, so I don't have to eat as many, right? Um, so if you think about from the standpoint of, um, I'll use Rocky as an analysis, right? If you're drinking the raw eggs, well, it's either that or you eat equivalent of, you know, 20 pounds of steak. Um, and so, you know, not all protein sources are, are, are created equal. Right. Um, and so, you know, that's some of the considerations that they'll, they'll take into account as well. Okay. More, more health questions. What best diet for a diabetic pet? Yeah, you know, typically they're going to yank out carbs, right? Um, and, and more importantly, um, carb uh, intake per day. Um, a, a lot of foods that are out there today, the uh, way they try to get at that, um, because they're kibble based, um, is, you, you know, most kibble foods can only, they have to be 30% or higher crude uh, carbohydrate just because of how they're formed and made, right? If you think about it, their extruder systems are no different than the cereal extruders. That's what they're designed to do is make puffy kibble. Um, and so what they'll typically do is they'll dump in a bunch of fiber uh, to rob the nutrients, right? So if you can't absorb it, it doesn't count in essence, right? Um, but it does in your backyard because you're paying for it and it goes, goes out that way. Um, but typically what you're going to look at is, um, you know, they're going to be lower carbohydrate foods. Again, that's one where um, if a veterinarian is trying to, and at this point, right, it really becomes important to work with your veterinarian because you're setting up insulin regimens and things of that nature. So he knows what you're feeding, what you're not. But again, um, the end game is low carbohydrate food. So it's have, have the discussion with him and then, you know, literally have the discussion with the food company that you're feeding. Do they have an option? Um, if they don't, then obviously you could start looking at what are alternatives, uh, at least in your store, you'll have a bearing on, hey, you know what, if they're targeting anything less than 20% carbs, you'll know in your store, hey, here's my selection. And then, you know, they can always take it back to the vet to get, you know, their approval. But um, with stuff like that, it really comes down to you, you got to be careful with, you know, your insulin and things of that nature. So no, no different than humans, right? You got to watch what you eat and, you know, do your dosage accordingly. Um, but there's right. lots of different ways to get there because typically with that, it's carbohydrate driven, right? And so there's lots of ways to to get at that. And it's not necessarily got to be, you know, therapeutic diet A. Right, right. I, I mean, I, like immediately when you say eliminate the carbs, my mind goes to raw. So mm -hmm. for a diabetic animal, you know, raw almost seems like the the best option for them to eliminate those carbs from the diet and that's why um on our for our website we actually if you look at our published analytical values we actually publish our starch and added sugar numbers and so we're um combined um which that added sugars obviously are coming from the fruits and vegetables i think that's one percent and then our starch is like five or six so we're yeah. below ten percent yeah um, carbohydrates and so obviously we're taking a uh, uh, raw diet and drying it. Um, so that gives you an indicator of where they should be. Um, yeah. But, you know, quick questions, ask them. Um, and they, they should be able to tell you. Exactly. Um, <clears throat> I, I think we've kind of touched on this. It was regarding joint health in older pets. I do see um, that we had, I just want to take a look here. I feed my dogs a raw blend, chicken blend that has veggies mixed in with it twice daily. Wondering what other supplements we should be providing our dogs or add-ons to the raw food. We include an ice cube of goat's milk once a day to their meals as well. So they're getting a raw chicken blend and some goat's milk. And I'm assuming that the blend would include uh, the vegetables, oh, veggies mixed in yeah, and um, micronutrients within the food. Is that the Lee Leonard comment? Oh, there we go. Or there see. we go, this one. Yes. All right. I feed both. Yeah, so I guess um, the question is, is do you know it's complete and balanced? Um, I, I'm assuming the assumption is yes. Um, and, and if the assumption is yes, um, you can always add other bennies or benefits, if you will, right? Um, things like 
certain fruits, blueberries, things of that nature. Um, you know, if you wanted to, depending on stage of life, obviously, um, fish oil, salmon oil, things like that, um, because it doesn't look like, you know, based off, and I'm assuming, so don't shoot the messenger, um, but uh, it doesn't look like you're probably getting a lot of um, the high omega fatty three, uh, omega three fatty acids. Um, so that might be something to, to consider, um, yeah, and especially as they get older, um, because that, that, that it plays in so many roles, the skin and coat, joint health, brain health, and all that. That's uh, literally when I say that's kind of like, um, you know, the Windex from my big fat Greek wedding, you know, I, I kid tongue, tongue in cheek about it, but um, there's a lot of, there's a lot of um, data scientifically to demonstrate the benefits of it. Um, and there's, yeah. and there's lots of, if you're not feeding fish, uh, there's lots of companies that make a little hand pump deal. Um, so you don't have to capsule it. So don't think you have to go that route. There's lots right. of easier ways to administer it. Right. Uh, that, so Lee's question is, is that she feeds raw to her little guys, goat's milk, homemade bone broth, uh, usually get pumpkin with their meals and banana at some time daily and wondering if this sounds balanced. And if she's feeding uh, Mega Raw, which is a Canadian made uh, raw food that we sell. Um, so it actually has a blend of the fruits and veggies uh, or veggies, pardon me, and the meat as well. So I'm assuming that's a complete and balanced food, correct? Yeah. 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 So, so, I mean, that answers the question right there. Um, you know, mo if you're unsure um, and you're, you're feeding um, brands like was just mentioned, um, they should have some sort of label on there that says complete and balanced. I know in Canada, technically, you don't follow AFCO, um, but if, if you're unsure, um, you know, ask the retailer, ask the company, <laughs> they'll, they'll know. Um, they're not going to lead you astray. Um, and, you know, that shouldn't be a guessing game ever. Uh, and so uh, I, if they don't know, um, I'd be surprised. Um, and then I mean you, Carly. I don't mean yeah. the company. The company better know. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes. No, they, I, you know what, what I really like about, uh, I know that we weren't, we weren't going to talk about brands, but I know that Mega and Bold are balanced, and I know that she actually she sends her food out. She she calls it Russian Roulette, Canadian made company, but she calls it Russian Roulette because uh, eleven times a year she sends a batch of her food to be independently tested at a third party lab to ensure that it is complete and balanced. So she has no idea what they're testing or what they're going to come back with for the results but she passes every time. So she's very diligent about, and, 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 and don't you get into your digestibility studies. <laughs> no, we, 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 we send ours out at too for, and, and obviously yeah. we go, we go beyond it with uh, taurine and carnitine because we have the silly belief that grain free causes DCM down here, but yet it doesn't impact anywhere else in the world, by the way. I know. Um, right. <laughs> and, so, and so we, we, we go beyond that as well. So she's sending it out. She's probably sending it out for, um, the AFCO panel. Um, and, you know, when you get that data in, it, it's, it's literally goof proof. Do you meet the number or, do, or don't you? Right. Um, and, and if she's, um, if she's routinely analyzing it, you know, kudos to her because, um, you know, I know more companies are starting to do that. Yeah. Um, and, and they should, because, um, you know, the re reality of it is, is, just because you formulate a food doesn't mean that's what you end up with. And, and, and that's part of the reason why um, it took us a while to, to launch, right? Is um, you, you want to make sure that what you're feeding is, is what you're feeding. Um, and, you know, otherwise you end up getting jammed up. So yes, kudos to her. And, and um, you know, even though she kids about the, the Russian roulette, stuff i mean everybody thinks that way when they send it out right because god forbid something happens and, and it's not always her fault it could be the analytical lab and then you got to wait longer to, yeah. before you release the product and so it's more of a i wouldn't call it russian roulette it's more of an anxiety filled time because even though you know the answer is going to be yes you did it you you still don't know because you don't have the data in hand right, right. um and, but it's she's doing it the right way to her credit and in fact she should um, she should own it and tout it because, um, like I said, there's, there's lots of companies that don't. And even the scarier part is, um, 
a lot of the big, bigger companies that make kibble today where you know there's heat loss and stuff going on, they don't even do it. They just simply formulate and go. Um, so yeah. kudos to her. And like I said, if I, if I was her, I, I, she should tout it um, and, and own it because that, that is a differentiating point for her. Yeah. Yeah, it is. Yeah. Um, okay. I think like those are pretty much our nutrition questions. I want to thank you very much, Ryan, for your time. We have kept you here almost an hour and 15 minutes now. Um, and okay, I, wanna, no <laughs> I want to thank everybody who, who gave us some questions to ask, Ryan. I want to thank you guys for spending your afternoon with us. And I appreciate all of you. I look forward to seeing you in store or either today or on Saturday. And I hope you guys have a fantastic weekend and enjoy the rest of your Friday. Again, thank you so much, Ryan. And we will see you all later. Bye-bye. Thanks, everybody.